Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on the FRB's Main Street Credit Programs and the renewed SBA's SBA programs. I would now like to turn the webinar over to Joe Liniak, a partner at Dorsey's Financing and Restructuring Group. Joe. Well, good to be with you today. Um, hope you and your families are healthy and safe. Uh, with, with so much of the workforce working in remote settings, our panelists are calling in from a number of locations. Uh, there's a chance the sound quality will vary, but we will do our best to keep it uniform. Uh, for example, in terms of problems which, which could occur, uh, this morning I woke up and somebody outside my door was using a jackhammer. Well, they've gone now, but hopefully they will not come back. I want to remind you that today's webinar is 60 minutes in length. Uh, if you're looking for materials and attendance sheets, they're available for download from Dorsey's webinar reminder sent to you yesterday uh, at events at Dorsey.com. Please don't forget to complete the attendance sheets and return them to attendance at Dorsey.com. Um, we're not going to have time for a Q&A, but attendees may contact a speaker directly or reach out to their trusted Dorsey contact. Uh, speaker contact information is included in the materials. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers today. Uh, and uh, first is Eric Detlefsen, who is one of our commercial uh, lending partners in our finance and restructuring group. Uh, and also Ken Logsdon, who is our resident expert in SBA uh, SBA issues. The agenda today is that we're going to discuss the latest updates to the SBA stimulus programs, which, as you know, are changing almost on a, on a daily basis with new information or changes coming from whether it's Treasury or the SBA. Then we're the, going, to, going to go on to discuss the Federal Reserve Board's two new Main Street lending programs. Uh, analyze important terms and conditions of the Main Street lending programs and highlight limitations and concerns of those programs, and they are many indeed. Uh, and then also, if we have time, to discuss some of the comments that Dorsey has made to Treasury to elaborate and define what those programs are and how our clients and, uh, and friends can make use of them. But before we go to the Main Street lending programs, I'd like to uh, turn the uh, podium over to Ken Logson, who's going to give you an update on the SBA stimulus programs and uh, what's, what's been going on um, uh, over the last week. Ken. Um, I'm also in the commercial finance group, but I'm based out of you know, Salt Lake City. Um, my colleague Eric Deplitson is actually based out of uh, Minneapolis, so uh, we, we don't have the opportunity to work together too often, but I'm happy to be able to do this webinar with him. As for the SBA component, as most of the audience already knows, there are two components to focus on here. Uh, one is the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, and the other one is what's been, been known as EDL. The Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Now, the CARES Act and this uh, subsequent stimulus bill that was passed does address both of them. And so there, there are programs that are acting in tandem, but most of this webinar will certainly focus on the PPP, though there is a little bit of overlap. As you can see here on the screen, these are the amounts that have been set aside for round two, as it's being called, round two, the PPP, but it also does pick up EDL. So it's round two of both programs. 310 billion total for the PPP, with 250 billion being unrestricted, if you will, with 60 billion of that being set aside for smaller financial institutions. As you can see here, 30 billion for financial institutions with assets less than 10 billion, and 30 billion for financial institutions that have access to 10 to 50 billion. Interestingly enough, on this particular topic, there's no doubt uh, a signal from Congress that they want smaller financial institutions and credit unions to participate 
in the PPP. Um, there's some concerns that perhaps the smaller institutions were crowded out by the activity under round one. Um, and so this has been an attempt to perhaps prevent that or, or, or jump in front of that uh, problem this second round. It's unclear how that's working. What we do know is that this, this latest uh, round, this round two, kicked off just two days ago on Monday. And it actually hasn't gone as smoothly as the first round, oddly enough. Uh, the E-Trans system has been struggling with the volume. And it has been such a significant issue that as of 30 minutes ago, the SBA has essentially blocked off and shut out financial institutions with assets over a billion, which is a rather small number if you really think about it. Um, but any financial institution with over a billion in assets, they are not going to be uh, able to process applications for the next eight hours. So we got about seven and a half hours left of that to go. The attempt there was to allow these smaller institutions to have access to ETRAN and then process the applications they have. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. It is unclear whether that's going to be a regular thing over the next several days, whether they're going to be setting aside other blocks, if you will, for, for smaller financial institutions. As for the dollar amounts that have been already spoken for, it's unclear, but the latest figure I was able to locate was about $50 billion as of uh, yesterday evening. So, you know, that gives us a pretty good idea of how much money is moving under round two. It could very well be exhausted by the end of this week, the time will tell. As for EDL, EDL has been uh, granted additional $50 billion for the traditional fund and then another $10 billion for the, the grant portion of it. Uh, the SBA has also been set aside uh, $2.1 billion for administrative expenses. As you can imagine, this is a massive undertaking and they certainly need the funds to pull this off. Uh, the law also made clear that agriculture enterprises are now included. They did not expand eligibility for uh, nonprofit. Um, and the Treasury is looking to other ways in which eligibility can be otherwise expanded or modified. Uh, interestingly enough there, it's unclear how much leeway they have. Uh, next slide, please. As for the program itself, just real quickly, I think most of uh, listening in know exactly what we're dealing with and when you say the PPP, but that's a loan that's going to be no more than two years in term with an interest rate of 1%, deferral of six months. It's 100% backed by the guarantee or the SBA. So there's a guarantee from the SBA. Loan proceeds are limited. Um, and there's also a, a eligible forgiveness feature. Let's go ahead and jump to the next slide to talk just a bit about that. I know at this stage, it's a little interesting and complicated in that there are still many companies that are coming in and they are essentially initial applicants. But I think even though we're in the throes of round two, most of the businesses out there are well aware of what the front end of this program looks like um, and are probably starting to focus their attention on the back end and specifically the forgiveness component. The forgiveness component, of course, is very applicable to banks as well because they'll have to be tracking how that looks. And as for forgiveness itself, right now we actually have an interim rule that came out yesterday that makes it clear that the period of forgiveness, that eight week period, it does start with the funding of the loan and that's when the clock starts to tick. As it comes to uh, expenses that will be forgiven, it would, only be for those amounts that go towards permitted uses of the loan proceeds, payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, um, and no less than 75% of the amount that's going to be forgiven is going to be in the form of payroll costs. Um, some of the more interesting features about the forgiveness process comes down to timing. Here on the slide, you'll see that I've highlighted in quotes right out of the, the act itself, it, it speaks to costs incurred and payments made during the covered period. There's, there's a question as to what does that mean exactly? Because certainly there's a difference between incurring an expense and actually paying on account of that expense. 
Is this intended to cover both, one or the other? It's a little unclear, but that's certainly going to move the needle on the analysis and the dollars that will be implicated when determining how much of the loan can be forgiven. I'm hoping, as the SBA has been so diligent in putting out FAQs and interim rules, that they won't stop now and they will be prepared to provide additional guidance around that particular issue, perhaps even in the form of some kind of an example of how forgiveness is to be uh, calculated. Um, when it comes to the overall process on the next slide here, you'll see that there's essentially four stages, right? You got to request a PPP loan uh, forgiveness. You have to prevent present the supporting documentation to the lender. The lender then has to turn around and submit the support, supporting documentation. Um, and then the verification process uh, has to be completed within 60 days. Uh, next slide. As for the documentation, uh, right now what we do know is there is a certain list of items that are going to be required. We suspect perhaps that list will be lengthened in time. Um, but nevertheless, there will be a formal forgiveness application that will be released. I, uh, I'm hopeful that that application will be rather formulaic. It'll be able to walk a particular borrower through the steps of what the loan forgiveness should look like. Probably not much different than maybe a tax form. And ideally, most of the, the questions that remain to be unanswered uh, with respect to some of these ambiguities will be addressed in the application itself. Um, but in addition to the application, uh, the borrowers and applicants are going to have to be prepared to produce evidence of their expenses, documentation verifying the number of the full-time equivalent employees on payrolls, uh, the pay rates for certain reference periods, payroll tax filings, uh, state income tax, fi tax filings, payroll and unemployment insurance filings, and even payroll registers. Uh, payroll invoices supporting the payroll cost and employee benefits and retirement benefits paid uh, should also be uh, prepared and the applicant should be uh, prepared to deliver those. And then also all the documentation in connection with the non-payroll related items uh, in respect of mortgage interest, payments, rent, and utilities. And that does include canceled checks, payment receipts, account statements, invoices, et cetera. Um, so there's going to be a lengthy list of documentation that needs to be provided on the back end, and it's, it's certainly lengthier than the list on the front end. And so that's something applicants will remain, uh, need to remain mindful of. Let's go ahead and go to the, the next slide here. As for the certification process, uh, and we're going to talk in just a moment here about just a general update on what's happening under the PPP, which also speaks to the front end certification. But for just a moment here, let's focus on the certification process in respect of forgiveness. Um, the lenders that are participating in the program will be required to obtain a certification from the borrower that the document, documentation presented is true and correct, and the amount for which is being forgiven um, is supported by the documentation and was used towards payroll costs, interest on payments, uh, utility, and other permitted payments. Um, there's already been a question posed in one of the FAQs as to whether lenders can rely on borrower document, documentation. And the answer is yes, lenders do not need to conduct any verification if the borrower submits documentation supporting its request for loan forgiveness and attest to the accuracy and verify the payments for eligible costs. Um, the SBA will hold harmless any lender that relies on that uh, the set of documents and attestation from the borrower. Um, the, the idea here is the SBA has determined that lender reliance on an applicant's documents and attestation is, uh, is necessary and appropriate. Uh, the one question I have when I see this is, does this pick up clear error? Perhaps not. Clear error was one of the standards we saw come out on the front end of the program with respect to uh, loan amount calculations. Um, I would find it unusual if that standard didn't remain. So if you're a lender and you're looking closely at this on the back end, 
and processing forgiveness uh, applications, that's something that you should bear in mind. As for the latest update on the program, there has been an incredible amount of activity over the last couple of weeks. Um, in addition to round two just kicking off two days ago, there's been a moving target of sorts of, of what institutions are intended to benefit from and have access to the PPP. As of just last Thursday, an FAQ was put out that spoke to the eligibility regarding necessity of the loan. It was a rather interestingly worded FAQ because it didn't speak of publicly traded companies expressly. It just made mention of large companies that have potential access to other capital or liquidity. And it goes on to say that companies that happen to have access to other capital or other liquidity uh, should carefully consider those other uh, opportunities. And to the extent obtaining that other capital or liquidity isn't, quote, significantly detrimental, end quote, that's the magic phrase, to the business, they should, uh, they should certainly consider that capital over the PPP. Um, the FAQ went on to say, by way of example, publicly traded companies will likely have a more difficult time saying they don't have access to capital because of their, just due to the nature of pu publicly traded markets, they apparently have access to capital, at least sufficient enough for the, the SBA to signal to the market that perhaps they are going to frown upon or probably more likely scrutinize more carefully publicly traded companies that are participating in the program. That's not to say that publicly traded companies are out altogether, but uh, certainly it's an indication that they're going to be reviewed closely. What I find curious about this FAQ, however, is that it came in the form of an FAQ. I think, I think the audience needs to be mindful that the FAQ is guidance and it can be helpful guidance, but it is not law. The interim rules that are being published on a regular basis, mind you, are law. And there has been some of those items that are addressed in that FAQ addressed in a rule that actually was put out on Friday. And that particular interim rule spoke to companies that happen to have backing or ownership by private equity firms. The question was, are those companies eligible under the PPP, even though there's a private equity firm that happens to own part of or a majority of the company? And yes, the question is, sure. Companies may very well be eligible, notwithstanding that particular fact, um, and provided the affiliate rules are looked at and analyzed and, and make sure that the company adheres to those, and there's, there's been a great deal of activity around that earlier on in the process, then it goes on to say that such applicant must uh, carefully review the certification that's provided in the application. And that's all the SBA said about that particular issue. Um, and what they're speaking to, is, of course, is the certification on the borrower application that the loan is necessary due to economic uncertainty, the loan request is necessary for business operations. Just yesterday, another FAQ has come out and it spoke to this very issue, again, in an FAQ, not an interim rule. And it said that companies that are owned by other companies that have access to capital um, the question is, are they required to, to consider that access to other capital? The answer to that question is, see the prior question, question 31 in the FAQ list if you're tracking, which was the one I just got done explaining, the one that has the, you know, the significant detrimental standard in it. So I think this is just another layer of complexity. Um, and so there seems to be somewhat of a moving target on what is really going to be required by publicly traded and privately held companies for purposes of being able to show that they are the intended recipient and should be eligible for these funds. With that, I'll turn it back over to my colleague, Joe. Oh, thanks very much, Ken. Um, uh, the audience may, wa uh, may want to be aware that last week the uh, at the behest of the federal banking regulators, the SBA put on a uh, short seminar describing uh, 
participating in in the program uh it's kind of like the uh the horse being out of the barn but in any event uh, as part of it they indicated that they will be issuing extensive guidance regarding the means by which lenders can get paid for originating loans as well as the forgiveness component that Ken has described but made it very very clear that that is all in process it is being built and so people really need to keep an eye a very close eye on how this is going to proceed but we're going to talk now about the uh, Federal Reserve Board's Main Street lending programs and it may be appropriate to give you a little background um, in the month of March the Federal Reserve Board an announced that they were creating uh, numerous credit facilities based upon their authority under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, and 13.3 is, is interesting because it goes back, and people probably remember uh, back to the subprime mortgage crisis, where the Federal Reserve Board used this authority and made loans. Some folks thought on a willy-nilly basis. Some thought thought on a basis of um, who was a friend of somebody at the Treasury at the time. And uh, uh, what happened was that after the after that crisis was over, uh, the, the Congress changed 13-3 to say that the Federal Reserve Board has to only use this authority when they are trying to protect the economy as opposed to individual companies. Uh, and as a result, you have the rollout in advance of these facilities so that then they can, they've got them in place. Most of them are dealing with liquidity, uh, but uh, in the case of uh, the CARES Act, they allocated $500 billion to uh, medium, um, uh, medium-sized businesses and also larger businesses, which are beyond the scope of what was contemplated by the Small Business Administration and the PPP programs and, uh, and what Ken was describing. Uh, in a somewhat curious release, though, the Fed announced that they were going to have a credit facility to support um, medium, uh, uh, medium-sized medium uh, businesses. Uh, and it, while it's welcome to the by, the by while it was welcome to the public, people it was kind of curious because the, the Fed doesn't do that type of lending, never has. Uh, however, they went forward on the ninth and announced two credit facilities to implement the announced Main Street credit facility. Uh, it was the Main Street new loan facility and the Main Street expanded loan facility. Now, you know, the, the acronyms are uh, cannot really be pronounced very well, so I'm going to be mainly, uh, mainly descri- describing the, the small facility as the Main Street facility and the expanded loan facility as the expanded facility. But they've got some... Um, uh, in the announcement, they said that the Treasury is going to uh, capitalize these facilities in the amount of $75 billion. Uh, uh, and as part of it, they're going to create a SPV, a special purpose vehicle, and they were going to uh, buy a 95% interest in loans originated by the banks through these facilities for a total amount of $600 billion dollars. And it works out to uh, the approximate one of the approximate capital requirements that banks have got of 12.5 percent when it's been capitalized by the 75 billion dollars. Now, because we're talking about 600 billion dollars, of course, they gave us four pages explaining what the programs were going to be. Nice job, guys. Uh, let's talk for a moment about what we know so far about the Main Street, the new credit facility, the uh, the smaller one. It's operated by the Federal Reserve Bank, and as I mentioned, the SPV, uh, uh, which will be organized, will purchase a 95% interest in so-called eligible loans, and the lender is going to have to keep 5% on its books. And that harkens back to the so-called skin-in-the-game requirement uh, uh, that happened under under Dodd Frank. Now, what are some of the definitions? Well, in order to be an eligible lender, you've got to be a U.S. FDIC insured depository institution. Uh, you could be a bank holding company, or you can be a savings and loan holding company. A couple of issues which immediately arose when they when they set out these standards, uh, because 
foreign banking organizations or FBOs, which actually provide a great deal of credit in the United States, have intermediate holding companies organized here in the United States, and the question arises whether or not uh, uh, below an intermediate holding company, a bank below that level, even though ultimately owned by a foreign banking organization, can participate. Actually not clear. There are also FDIC-insured foreign bank branches and agencies, some of which are sizable, and the question becomes whether they can uh, uh, participate. And then you've got affiliates of holding companies, and if it's not a bank, how do you do the funding necessary, even though theoretically the affiliates could, make, could be making the loans? Now, an eligible borrower is uh, defined as businesses with up, up to 10,000 employees. Uh, and if you remember in the uh, in PPP, you can only have up to 500 employees. Well, you theoretically can apply to both the PPP and this uh, and, and, uh, and this facility, and the maximum size for uh, is is 10,000 employees, or up to 2.5 billion in in 2019 annual revenues. Now, I would point out there that usually when you have an alternative, you will say either the greater of or the lesser of. And there's no mention as to which uh, which of these are going to be controlling whether or not one or the other is a cap. We're going to have to figure that out uh, when they give us more than four pages uh, of instructions. Um, and the, and the, the business must be created or organized in the United States and have significant operations and a majority of, majority of its employees based in the United States. As a technical matter, it cannot, uh, uh, for the small Main Street loan program, it cannot participate in the larger Main Street loan program or in the Federal Reserve Board's primary market corporate credit facility. Now, it's also, um, uh, we get, when we get into the loan terms, the loan must be originated after April 8th with the following terms and conditions. It's a four-year maturity loan amortizing principal and interest, but principal and interest will be deferred for one year. Now, uh, that means that, that impliedly means that interest will accrue during the deferral period. For those of you who are lending aficionados, you may know that depending upon state law, you may have to put into loan documents that interest can be added to principal and compounded. That's something which we're going to have to figure out. Also, too, something which has been highly criticized, and that is the rate of interest is the um, secured overnight finance rate, or SOFR, plus 250 to 400 basis points. Now, in the statute, it says 200 basis points, and yet here we see in the minimum it's 250 basis points to 450 basis points. Now, last, last week, the SOFR was at one-tenth of 1%. And so you end up with at least a 50-point push higher than what the statute seems to require them to be doing, a minimum loan size of $1 million, and a maximum loan size equal to the lesser of two standards, $25 million or the amount that when added to the borrower's uh, existing outstanding and committed but uh, undrawn debt does not exceed four times the borrower's 2019 EBITDA. Now, it's also interesting that they threw in EBITDA because, uh, for again, for those of you on the finance side, um, EBITDA is really earnings with your interest taxes, depreciation, and am amortization added back in. However, it's important to note that it is not a gap concept. And so it can be, will widely vary in terms of the way that it is interpreted. Uh, Prepayment, um, uh, may be permitted without penalty. EBIT, the EBITDA issue has caused a great deal of consternation as people are calculating what that might be in their qualification to be able to obtain funds. Let's turn for a moment to the extended loan facility. Uh, this one is a little bit quirky. Uh, it's effective April 9th of, uh, uh, of this year, and similar in many respects to the structure of the lower um, uh, Main Street facility. It's capitalized by the Treasury. 
you, it, it's going to utilize uh, an SPV to purchase 95% interest in loans. Most folks think it's going to be just one SPV that's going to be uh, that's going to be operating here, uh, buying loans from both uh, the larger and smaller uh, Main Street facilities. The uh, an eligible lender is the same as in the lower uh, Main Street facility, as well as that for an eligible borrower. Uh, but as and again in parallel this construction an eligible borrower for the uh, uh, extended lo uh, loan facility may not participate in the smaller loan facility or the primary market credit facility operated by the Federal Reserve Board. Now, this is where it gets a little bit squirrely because it states that in order to, to uh, it, the extended loan facility must be a modification of an existing term loan extended before April 8th of this year. So if you will, it's an add-on on top of, or maybe below, a facility that has been extended to you, uh, and they describe it as an upsized tranche uh, with the following loan terms. For your mat maturity, amortization of principal and interest deferred for one year, and again, the, the interest rate above what the statute seems to say, a minimum loan size of $1 million, uh, a maximum loan size, again, well, here there's three different uh, components. Uh, the lesser of $150 million, or 30% of the borrower's outstanding and committed but undrawn bank debt, or an amount uh, which does not exceed, again, with computation six times the borrower's 2019 EBITDA, uh, again, very, very strange as to why they require an existing loan facility uh, that this thing will have to piggyback onto. And a lot of folks have, uh, including uh, uh, Dorsey, have indicated that that really does not make a lot of sense. Let's talk a little bit about the loan origination and administration issues. Uh, the SPC facility fee uh, is... Uh, indicates that the lender must pay the SPV a facility fee of 100 basis points of the principal amount of the loan participation purchased by the SPV, but thankfully they indicated that that fee may be passed on to the borrower, which means that the ultimate fee which we can obtain from the borrower is 200 basis points. Uh, there's a uh, a, a, a problem with the wording of the, um, in terms of the enhanced loan facility in that this requirement is uh, um, slightly improperly uh, um, uh, written. It's probably a typo, will probably be fixed, but we need to keep our eye on that. There's a loan origination fee in that the borrower must pay a lender the origination fee of 100 basis points, meaning that you end up with a, a 200 basis point uh, income for the um, uh, for a, one of these loans, the servicing fee is 25 basis points per annum on the principal amount of the participation in the loan that is being serviced. So that means you get 25 basis points on 95% of the loan, and the facility termination will uh, the SPV will cease purchasing these participations on September of this year unless extended. Now, here's some issues which, again, um, are going to have to be looked at very, very closely because there's attestations or certifications which are required by both lenders and borrowers. The lender must attest that the loan proceeds will not be used to repay or refinance pre-existing loans or lines of credit made by the lender to the borrower. And the lender may not cancel or reduce any existing lines of credit outstanding to the borrower, which means that you can't pay down existing lines of credit. The next one is really, really disturbing. Both the lenders and the borrowers must certify that the borrowing entity is eligible to participate in the loan program. Now, as you're probably listening, you're saying, gee, the, this is much more complicated than what, what is taking place under the PPP, and what hap we're supposed, we as a lender have got to certify this is, um, as being uh, correct and the borrower qualifies. Um, 
uh, it really raises some real significant issues for liability on the part of uh, on the part of lenders. Now, the, the next the next set of certifications is something that the borrower has to certify to. And I would suggest to you that when you go through these and look at these, you will say, "Gee, what this, these programs are really aimed at? They're intended to be working capital loans." for eligible borrowers to get back into business maybe three or four months from now after our crisis is over and the economy is is uh, is coming back to normal. Uh, why is that? Well, because they, they are not able to reduce any of their outstanding lines of credit with the originating borrower. Uh, they've got to refrain from using the proceeds to repay other loan balances. They've got to commit to um, to refrain from repaying other debt uh, or, or of equal or lower priority. Uh, use the proceeds to, the, to make reasonable efforts to maintain their payroll and uh, meet EBITDA leverage conditions. Uh, and uh, notably, they will follow the compensation, repurchase, and capital distribution restrictions that apply to direct loan programs under the CARES Act, which are discretionary. And so that certainly does raise the question, who makes the decision as to whether or not uh, you've got to repay, you've got to give stock to the, uh, to the government, you've got to undertake not to repurchase loan, uh, repurchased uh, these things. And again, the, uh, 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 this has created a great deal of controversy uh, in the uh, in the media press, particularly over the last several days. Before we go on and and uh, listen to Eric describe some of his comments and some of the criticisms and concerns about the programs, I want to give all of you out there the CLE code, and the CLE code is QWR three zero two. Again, that's QWR. 302. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Eric to discuss some Main Street lending programs concerns. Eric. Hey, thanks, Joe. Uh, it's kind of funny to see what I used to look like um, in that picture um, before before disheveled quarantine hit. Um, no. Uh, so yeah, kind of reflecting on the last couple of uh, weeks and hearing you and, and Ken talk about these various programs. I know certainly our firm and I'm sure a lot of you on the line uh, have have filled you know, a lot, many inquiries from companies or uh, you know, clients or your business partners um, handling the logistics of the of the PPP. Um, and I, you know, not to be, I'm, I'm the I'm the negative uh, set of slides here, I guess. But you know, at a conceptual level, um, the company profile and the loan size here really fit our Dorsey's target market. And I know, based on the RSVP list, a lot of the you know our firms and institutions um, on the line here could you know really do stand to benefit from. Um, from the programs here, if if, uh, if if the companies that we work with or or the companies that you all uh, represent internally um, were able to participate or or make loans in this program, uh, and I think the issue becomes when we when we dig in practically and review the details uh, of these programs or what at least details are available, uh, we perceive I guess significant impediments to you know to Dorsey the lender clients. Um, and then also our borrower clients uh, taking advantage uh, of the programs. Um, I guess, so I'll frame what I perceive those impediments to be uh, so that you can guide your, your clients or business partners right now, um, but then also so that you know what to look for um, in the event or if these programs are uh, modified by uh, guidance in the coming days and weeks. Um, so I've, I've discussed these uh, programs with a number of folks and participated in industry group calls. Uh, and I think I would say one of my contacts in a, in a capital markets group at a bank client that we work with, I think summarized the market perspective well. He said basically that these programs are just not as much of a no brainer uh, compared to the PPP, right? I mean, this is not free money. Um, and in fact, it may be harder depending on your business to be eligible for this program um, you know, both as a lender and a borrower, um, and of course, then 
as I'll touch here, there's some significant, Joe touched on some of these, but there's a significant operational challenge uh, if for both borrowers and lenders who, who uh, want to participate in this program. Um, so focusing in on this, on this slide here, uh, lender and specifically lender eligibility. So at, at Dorsey, we do, we do quite a bit of work for banks, uh, but I'd say serving the middle market lending space uh, for, you know, the last 10 years, uh, there's been a pretty significant shift, uh, 10 years or, or a little bit more than that. Um, in the presence of non-bank lenders, right? So something like a private fund, uh, but these private funds are excluded uh, from participating as lenders in the Main Street lending programs. Uh, so at least as a firm that immediately knocks out a handful or many of our clients in our space. And of course, for those of you who are in-house counsel at a bank, uh, that of course knocks out some of your competition uh, in the middle market space. So cuts both ways on the company side, uh, if you are a, a company that has a private fund as a lender, um, just know that what the, the extended facility or the larger facility that Joe was referring to, you know, that's not available to you, right? If, if your lender is uh, not a, an eligible bank, um, you can't do an add-on tranche to your, uh, to your loan facility. Um, the... Um, you know, in, in that situation, of course, the company can get a uh, new loan facility with an eligible bank, but as Joe touched on, some of the eligibility uh, is a little bit more limited and the dollar size is, is, is smaller. Um, so we said private funds are excluded. Joe touched on that foreign banks uh, may be entirely excluded or it's an open question if maybe the domestic branch of a foreign bank may be eligible. But if you take that, uh, you know, those, those both the private funds and, and some in some way a foreign bank, um, consider that a lot of the loans in this space are syndicated, right? And so what we don't know is if the presence of a private fund uh, or a foreign bank uh, within a syndicate or, or participating in a syndicated loan disqualifies that entire loan from the extended uh, loan program, um, or right, if you're on the company side, if you've got a broadly syndicated loan, does that mean you cannot do this extended tranche because uh, half of your facility or a quarter or a smaller function uh, fraction is um, is participated to a to a foreign bank, right? So, so that's that's one question, kind of, can a lender participate? Piggybacking a little bit on, on what what Joe was was teeing up at the end there, uh, you know, maybe do do lenders even desire to or want to participate? Um, Ken and Joe both talked about that the the PPP program has built-in protections regarding uh, lender reliance on borrower reps and warranties, and uh, you know the PPP in theory requires very limited underwriting. Well, here uh, lenders are required to make attestations regarding borrower eligibility and permitted use of proceeds and certain aspects of the borrower relationship, right? So the, you know, a lender can't cancel or reduce lines of credit needs to attest to that fact. I guess bottom line is uh, that there, there is a relatively significant risk to banks here uh, that need to be um, considered. I think and, and a couple of these bullets are a little bit more mechanical uh, maybe, but you know, there's not form loan documents available for this program. So lenders are going to create new docs uh, or engage outside counsel to create new documents. And, you know, in that context, there's, as, as documentation is being crafted, guidance is not available or has not been provided as to the intended scope or terms of the documentation uh, that will be acceptable to the Fed's SPV, right? So, um, you know, who, I mean, a question is who is representing in negotiations uh, the Fed's SPV entity here, or is there any um, sense by, or, or limiting factor uh, for, for terms in the, um, in the documentation that the, that the SPV side may, may drive? Um, jump to the next slide, Joe, because I want to think about the borrower eligibility side. Um, Joe hit on that there's the maximum uh, debt to EBITDA 
ratio that affects the loan size, uh, right? And well, if you think about it, typically um, medium-sized businesses that, as Joe said, gosh, if we're, if we're really focusing this program on getting businesses back going again, that might be a, a little bit of a distressed scenario, right? Or, or a, a, perhaps a levered business already. So depending on how the calculations uh, come out, that might already exclude a significant chunk of the target market for this program. Joe mentioned uh, with respect to EBITDA, and I think it's worth reiterating, right? If you've spent a lot of time around a loan agreement for a middle market loan, like we're talking about here, you'll see the relatively lengthy definitions of EBITDA. Uh, not a gap concept, Joe mentioned. There's a lot of variation from uh, agreement to agreement on how EBITDA is determined and calculated, right? So um, at, at this time though, and I think to the extent that there's a consensus, I, I think the, there's a belief that addbacks are not permitted so broadly constructed ad back. So you would not be able to take your existing adjusted EBITDA definition and just plug and play from your compliance certificate uh, into the uh, calculation of the, of the leverage for determining the loan size. Uh, so potentially something for um, borrowers to keep in mind. Um, these next couple, think about the make sense. The programs are, are designed to primarily benefit US companies. Uh, the way that these term sheets target that concept is it says that there must be significant US operations and majority employees in the United States. And uh, we just don't know what uh, significant, <laughs> significant means um, in, this, in, in terms of providing specific guidance to clients. Um, we also don't know if entities that have um, equity held internationally are, are eligible to participate here. Some guidance that uh, that's being sought. Um, again, not to overly compare to PPP, but the that program was kind of overlaid under an existing SBA loan program already that had a several hundred pages of guidance on who's eligible to participate. So uh, this is just a, a different paradigm in terms of um, eligibility. I think um, yeah, Joe mentioned that you can participate, but you can participate in the PPP um, and this program. I think the real question though is, you know, practically do companies want to sign up for this or if they must, and, and, and this is the only option, are they eligible to? I think that's a, a bit of a tension, um, you know, the bullet here. This is, like I said before, not free money uh, and there are, um, significant restrictions. I think Joe jumped to the next slide because I think we can talk about, you know, borrower willingness and lender willingness to participate in uh, these programs at the same time in some of these operational uh, restrictions. Um, again, for, for political reasons, there are restrictions on these loans uh, for the use of proceeds of these loans. So, restrictions from section 4003 of the CARES Act, uh, which limits uh, share buybacks, executive comp, and dividends and distributions, uh, not necessarily just while the loan is in place, but for a, a, a tail period as well. Uh, something that uh, needs to be uh, considered. Joe pointed out, but I'm, I'm, I wanna reemphasize two things. Um, here, especially with regard to existing capital structure and the use of proceeds, um, you, you cannot use the proceeds of these loans to repay existing indebtedness. Now, the, the calculate, it, it, it's a tricky discussion here because of course cash is fungible, right? So um, it, I think there becomes, in, in, if we had to practically guide somebody along here, there's a bit of a timing component. Um, if, if the program doesn't otherwise restrict repayment, um, I think you need to be evaluating uh, other cash on hand or perhaps uh, revenue that comes in in order, to, uh, in order to be paying off other debt at the time. But you cannot use this loan to refinance other loans. It's just, that's a black and white item. Um, a little more nuanced, uh, but to me equally concerning is that once uh, one, when the loan is funded uh, and until repaid in full, 
the borrower is blocked, right? Is blocked from repaying debt of equal or lower priority. Okay, so uh, looking at the two programs separately. So the, the larger, the extended loan facility, that's uh, meant to be peri pursu, so, so shared collateral and priority with the existing debt that's being extended. Uh, so if you have uh, an existing revolver and term loan that are secured and you add this tranche of extended debt, that's of course shared equal priority now with the new debt. So you can't repay your existing lender, right? In the new loan facility space, uh, those loans, the new loans are uh, expressly unsecured. And so if you're taking a new loan and you have other unsecured debt, uh, say an unsecured revolver that you can't use as a, as a revolver like you normally uh, would, you can't repay that, um, that indebtedness. So uh, there's a reason I put lender consent here next to uh, this repayment. Uh, prohibition, almost any loan agreement in place uh, now is going to require uh, the, the affirmative consent of the existing lender, right? Uh, and so just frankly, it may be an uphill battle to get your existing lender to sign up to these payment restrictions. Just uh, again, more of a practical concern, but both for lenders and for borrowers, I think. Um, this next bullet, I mean, there's just the preference of desiring to be able to make distributions on, on the business model side, but some of this can be a little bit more uh, binary, right? Black and white. If you're, um, if the loan is, is accompanied with a prohibition on distribution. So if you are a borrower, that's an LLC uh, that needs to be able to make distributions for tax, we don't believe those distributions would be permitted, right? Or if you take a professional firm, like a law firm or an accounting firm that pays itself using uh, distributions, your compensation mechanism is disrupted and, and, and you're basically just practically not eligible for this program. Um, this next bullet I think is, is, is again, a, a practical thing to think about, uh, but gets, gets law firms excited, I guess, for an extended loan. Uh, so you have your underlying or existing loan documentation uh, to, to, for which you're going to add a new tranche of debt. But uh, I think the, the, almost all of the core terms of the new tranche are going to be different uh, from the existing or underlying debt, right? So the amendment document or the incremental loan document is going to be quite complicated and expensive. Uh, Joe mentioned, but one of the different terms in this next bullet uh, you're going to have is, is a, a totally different interest rate uh, mechanism for de determining a reference rate. Uh, the term sheets for both facilities or both programs contemplate a SOFR uh, reference rate. SOFR is certainly being considered as a potential LIBOR replacement candidate, but uh, practically speaking now, no banks that... Um, that we work with uh, consistently anyway, are, are regularly offering or originating commercial loans based on the SOFR, right? So the, the rate can be, it, SOFR is published, uh, some aspects of SOFR are uh, published and can be determined, but uh, the loan administration system, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, is the, the originating bank does need to uh, service and administer the loan, uh, there's just, unclear if the SOFR mechanism uh, can be operationalized yet. Um, one of the, so this amortization concept. So, so if you look at the, the term sheets, uh, it's again, a little murky, but I think the understanding is that you, so you certainly have a one year principal and interest deferral, but then the loan probably needs to be fully amortized uh, during the remaining four-year uh, term. So, um, so typically we see that loans in this space at least follow a longer amortization period. So say a 10-year AM structure with a bullet payment at five-year maturity. And so your, your principal payments are just lower because you're not 
there's a balance of the of the principal obligation that remains at the end. Uh, here, it, it appears that amortization is, is a full amortization structure. Um, Joe uh, mentioned that the uh, new loans are, are going to be unsecured. Extended loans are secured on the same basis as the existing loans. Uh, that for extended loans is kind of a com complex problem. Perhaps you've got some, uh, you're going to certainly have pro rata sharing that needs to be considered for perhaps different collateral pools within um, within different tranches of debt. Uh, and, and so this detail here might prove unworkable. Again, back to the, to the lender uh, consent issue. This last bullet's kind of, again, well, the, I mean, these are all operational or kind of mechanical practical items, but so the loans are going to be originated by a bank, right? And then the, this works that 95% of the loan is then purchased by the Fed's SPV. I mentioned that the bank is required to service the loan, so receive payments, pass on payments to the SPV. Now, no mention is made uh, of the the logistics for administering the credit, right? So uh, we see in other provisions of the CARES Act that uh, in the context of equity interests, if the Fed uh, federal government ever owns equity interests under the CARES Act, the federal uh, holder entity or the, the government does not get voting rights. Um, but here, right, it's not clear if the if the 5% interest that's retained by the originating lenders, are they just supposed to vote as if they hold 100% of the loan, right? That's not clear. So Joe, jump back to the next slide. And I guess as I zoom back out, I would invite the elder statesman Joe Liniak to weigh in. You got <laughs> decades of bank regulatory experience. I don't. So, for the folks on the line, it, you know, it might be that your business partners um, are able to navigate these pitfalls. But I guess on the whole, my my observation is that the industry uh, segment participants we interact with are just concerned that the issues that Joe's outlined or that I've outlined uh, are, are really going to severely limit the applicability of these Main Street programs. Um, I think th this first bullet's really a, a Joe observation, right? These folks aren't commercial lenders, um, and yet they've rolled these plans out to the market and to Congress. Uh, and so we frankly just don't know how much movement uh, can be expected if it's a, you know, a whole paradigm shift or, or if it's minor tweaks. Um, but, you know, I don't know, Joe, if you have thoughts as we, as we get close to the end here of, of what to expect. <laughs> Oh well, um, uh, thank thank you, um, uh, Eric. Um, you know, the yesterday the the Fed came out with um, a uh, a number of pronouncements, uh, which among which is they received over two thousand comments about their pro about these programs, many of which were, "Do you guys have any idea how our industry operates?" Uh, and they they said, well, we maybe what we will do is have different variations beyond these two programs, and uh, maybe we will expand them. Uh, but what they also said, and emphasized this is uh, compared to the PPP, this is not a grant program. This is a lending program. We expect to be uh, we expect to be repaid. And uh, so I, I think that for those of you out there that are financial institutions, you need to be taking close eye on these developments as they uh, they come out. Again, I, I'm of the view that these are these are really going to be uh, working capital loans that will uh, help the uh, the, the mid mid level marketplace, and um, it's going to require some heavy lifting in order to do it, and on the part of borrowers to determine whether or not the restrictions that people are putting on these. Will be uh, uh, are sufficient to uh, to, uh, to balance you know, to be balanced against getting the uh, uh, the credit. Just uh, before we uh, before we end, I just wanted to just give you a quick idea of some of the comments that we made to the Fed as part of that comment process. One was the extended Main Street facility. What we tried to point out was we think this uh, uh, higher tranche add-on loan concept is frankly not very workable as eric indicated putting on a whole different level of uh of a tranche with new terms and conditions and getting all of the 
lenders in one room to agree to a uh, to a change and looking at the uh, the collateral issues it's probably not workable and what they should do is uh, uh, allow in, uh, separate credits to be taking place we mentioned the EBITDA issue and there should be uh, uh, they, that may be an option but uh, it, it could could end up being very confusing particularly because of the way that you can uh, go on uh, in do an extensive uh, uh, in extensive detail what EBITDA means. Uh, the operating restrictions, uh, corporations looking at the operating restrictions of what they can use the, the uh, funds for are objecting. Uh, documentation from the perspective of we as, uh, as lawyers working for banks, the documentation uh, is probably going to pay for some college uh, college tuition, and that part is good, but the idea of sitting back and really figuring out how do we do it uh, is going to be formidable. There's, there's a few other things. We, we mentioned the attestation. We also mentioned the waiver issue. Will they give us the opportunity to waive, and also who will make those decisions in terms of optional issues such as taking back shares of stock um, and so forth? We are now uh, getting to the end. And um, if you have questions, uh, you're welcome to follow up directly with us or call your trusted Dorsey contact. Uh, uh, the, please sign the attendance sheet. Uh, we are going to be following both the PPP program and the Main Street program very closely. We expect that the Federal Reserve, when it goes down the road and takes a look at liquidity issues, will be enhancing liquidity facilities and we will be uh, uh, put, putting out advice and uh, uh, to our clients and friends regarding those facilities as they're rolled out, as well as uh, what these Main Street facilities really will look like when they expand beyond the four pages of information that they gave us. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, uh, participating today. We hope our comments were useful to you in getting an idea of where we stand. We hope you, you and your family stay safe. Uh, and uh, look forward to speaking with you in the near future um, on these topics. Thanks very much for our presenters, and uh, have a great rest of the day.